you have your Bibles uh, there, I'd like you to turn to Proverbs chapter 31, starting at verse 25. Proverbs chapter 31, starting at verse 25, says, Strength and dignity are her clothing, and she laughs at the time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her works praise her in the gates. You know, so as we think about um, the, the calling that God has given to moms, um, to women in particular, um, one of the truths or, or some of the truths that stand out to me in this scripture passage um, is often countercultural to our world. And so I want us to consider some of these thoughts here this morning and ask ourselves, what does it mean to, to become what God has called us to become? And in particularly to you moms. You know, God has, God has a, a unique and special calling on moms. But I know often in our world today, that interpretation looks a little bit different than it probably has looked in times past, and, and I've entitled the message this morning, Calling Moms Home, because I believe that there's an importance for us to, to consider the specific calling that God has upon moms, and sometimes it's quite different than how the world promotes motherhood. And in this scripture passage, as we consider um, a biblical definition, a biblical guide even, um, I think it's important for us to consider this, and I know that, that sometimes when, we're, when we go over a message that deals with moms, some of you here are like, well, I'm not a mother, this doesn't apply to me, but the fact of the matter is it does. Um, if you have no children, you, you still have an obligation, you still have a requirement, and we're going to get into that a little bit as we study the Word of God today, um, but this is even a great message for us as men and um, in single people, because the, the family unit thrives when they have a, a shared, consistent vision. And so it's important for us to, to see, well, what does the Bible say about motherhood? And, and if this is what the Bible says, how can I come alongside and support this great and effective calling that moms have? So I want us to look at that first part there, and we're going to cover just a few points here. And the first point is that a biblical mother is clothed in strength and dignity. Notice how that verse says that their strength and dignity are her clothing, and she laughs at the time to come. You know, this speaks about, about confidence and commitment, and it speaks about a role that, that this particular um, person that Solomon is describing here in Proverbs 31, you know, he says strength and dignity are her clothing. This is what she wears. This is how she goes through life. In our, in our um, counterculture, um, or, or in, our, in our society today, the, the strength that is taught is a different strength than we're seeing here. In fact, I would venture to say it's a weakness. And here, he says, strength and dignity are her clothing. One of the, the, the things that I see in this particular scripture passage is that true biblical motherhood is, is one of strength. And it's guided by the Spirit of God. You know, when I, when I think about moms and I think about the endurance that God gives to moms, it's incredible. It's amazing. It's something that you don't see from any other individual in the, in, in the world, really. You know, when I, when I think about the, the love that mothers have for their children, for example, or 
when they're dealing with challenges in the home. You know, there's a willingness to sacrifice and commit like nobody else is willing to. When you think about, about strength and dignity being the clothing of a mom, you, you notice that even in things like child um, labor pains and these kinds of things. When a, when a mom brings a child into the world, you know, there's strength and endurance that God has not given to men, but he's given it to women. But it's, it's not just there. When I, when I think about motherhood, I, I even think about the strength in the commitment that moms have when they, they have to get up at all hours of the night often to tend to the needs of their children, and they do this willingly. And it doesn't end there. Um, often when you see um, moms go through the challenges of raising teenagers, you know, every single one of you who has, has gone through uh, this period of raising teenagers, you know sometimes the challenges, the, the difficulty that come in the midst of those things. And, and I've, I've personally, I, I've had a front row seat. I've, I've watched my wife deal with these things time and time again. And I've, I've so often come away admiring the endurance and the strength and the dignity with which she handles the, the challenges that come her way. Whether it's, it's bringing children into the world, whether it's dealing with, with children who are sick at nighttime, and whether it's dealing with the challenges of teenagers, there's something amazing about a biblical mom, a mom who desires to, to raise her children for the Lord. And this love and this commitment that, that they demonstrate is beyond anything else. One of the the thoughts, though, as we consider this topic here this morning is, is that sometimes as a mother, you might think, well, I had so many aspirations and so many plans and so many desires, and I, I look at myself today, and, and I feel like I'm a failure. I feel like I couldn't and haven't been the mom that I wish I would have been. And one of the the blessings that I have seen over and over again, even recently, is that we serve a redemptive God. We serve a God who is able to make beauty from ashes, beautiful things out of things that were not, being able to, to turn um, what the enemy has meant for evil to turn that into something good. And I just want to share with all of you women here today when you think about the calling that God has upon your life, even if you don't have a little one, God has a calling upon your life. And God has a purpose for your life. And, and even if you feel like you were a failure, you serve a redemptive God who is able to give you strength today for a fresh start. To, to start again. Maybe you failed with your own children. Maybe you, you could have done things better, but maybe now God has given you grandchildren or great-grandchildren, uh, or, or God has maybe allowed you to be an influence to a younger woman in your own life or a younger person in your own life. And so there's so many ways that we can perceive this, this calling, this strength and dignity. Um, I was reminded of the story of Esther in the book of Esther. Here's, here's a young woman who, who becomes a queen, a queen over the entire land. And, and as you know the story of Esther, you, you recognize that, that when she became a queen, it was different perhaps than when we view queens today. Today when you, when, when you view a modern queen, you know, everybody's kind of at her beck and call. Well, in this era, she recognized that her life was in the hands of her husband. Her husband, at, at his own whim, could destroy her, could, could kill her if that was what he wished to do. So it was different than it was today, but she was queen of the land. And, and when the, the mandate came down that her people were going to be destroyed, were going to be slaughtered uh, all across the face of the, the earth at that time, the request came that she should intercede in front of the king on behalf of her people. And so... We don't believe she was a mother here at this point, but she was a mother to Israel. And this is, this is the concept. This is the strength 
that I, I've often witnessed and observed in so many moms um, all across the globe, and I know even represented here, the strength and dignity that so many of you are clothed with is the same thing Esther had. See, Esther recognized that the king hadn't called her into his presence for a long time. And so she, she recognized that there's a possibility that if I appear before the king, he's going to reject me and condemn me, and that's the end of my life. So she asks people to pray and fast for her. And then she resolutely makes this decision. And this is the heart of a mother who is clothed in strength and dignity. And she says this, she says, A nation depends upon me. If I perish, I perish. An amazing statement she makes. I'm willing to give of myself if perhaps it will mean a future protection for the children. And so this is, this is the strength and dignity, I believe, that, that is being talked about here in Proverbs chapter 31. And I just want to encourage you, every single one of you, as women, you have this strength inside of you. It's in you to give. And God has this calling upon your life. But let's move on here. It says there, she opens her mouth with wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. See, a, a biblical mother teaches from a heart of wisdom and a heart of kindness. She opens her mouth with wisdom. She has a lot to say. She has a lot to give. She has a lot to, to bring into the world. And this is what I really would like us to focus on specifically this morning. The teaching of kindness is on her tongue. You know, you as, as moms, you as women in particular, there is such a high calling upon your life that you, you that, that I hope that you see the seriousness of the calling upon your life, even as we go through some passages here this morning. And, and I would invite you, if you have your Bibles, to turn to Titus chapter 2, as we um, expound a little bit on this passage here. Titus chapter 2, verse 3. As Paul's giving instruction to the church here, he says this, he says, Older women likewise are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good, and so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. I want you to notice some things here. When, when you see the word older women, I think sometimes we think, well, the, those in their 60s and 70s ought to be teaching. But I would, I would venture to say that many of you in your 20s already, you can start to look upon uh, girls and young women that are younger than you and you can mentor and be an example to them. And you can teach them. You know, in your 30s, in your 40s, in your 50s, in your 60s, you have something to offer to the generation that's coming behind you. And, and he says this, you as women, you ought to teach what is good. You ought to train the young women to love their husbands and their children and to be controlled, pure, and working at home. You know, Proverbs chapter 127, verse 3, or Psalm 127, 3 says, says that children are a heritage from the Lord. That the fruit of the womb is a reward. And, and here again, as we consider this whole thought of, of the calling that God has upon motherhood, we, we again recognize that even, even children, having children, and being blessed with children is countercultural. You know, the, the movements that we have seen in our world today um, come from a brand of feminism that is ungodly and that has very ungodly roots. And I want to share some thoughts with you here this morning in that regard. Two of the most prominent women today that are in front of feminist movements are women like Ilse Hogue, the president of Neural, 
or of Nero, and Cecil Richards, the president of Planned Parenthood. Both of these women have received praise for proudly proclaiming their choices to abort their children because it just wasn't the right time. You know, this is, these women are on the front lines today of feminism and are hailed as heroes in the feminist movement. And I just want to share some thoughts based on this from an article called Tomorrow's World by Douglas Winnell. The, the feminist movement um, and, and we need to talk about this today because it has caused so much damage and destruction. And my personal opinion is today that I know that so many of you young women, even you young moms, you are, you are being influenced by social media. Um, whether it's Facebook, whether it's Instagram, whether it's Pinterest, whether you know, it's um, podcasts that you're listening to, articles that you're reading, there's, there's an influence that is seeking to destroy your calling and your destiny in what God has called you to do. But as we consider um, feminism, we understand that it didn't, it didn't all start bad. And I want to just share some of these thoughts with you. In the beginning, a number of years ago, um, not, not in the beginning as Genesis 1, but as we think even a little bit about North America and, and some of the origins of our history here, women a uh, hundred years ago had almost no legal rights. We, we find from history that they could not own property, which is different even than Proverbs 31, which tells us this Proverbs 31 woman could go and, and buy property. Well, in this particular time in history, Women were abused to a great degree. They couldn't own property. They couldn't even have custody of their children if there was a divorce. In states such as Massachusetts and, and, and Vermont, it was a greater crime 100 years ago to steal a cow than to abduct and rape a girl. So this, was, this was horrible. This was ungodly. Women who joined the first wave of feminism during this time, they sought equal treatment and opportunity to be recognized as human beings and not as property. In addition to seeking to vote, he says in this article, he says, they campaigned against alcohol abuse, traffic and drugs, against prostitution, against child labor, against exploitation of the poor, dangerous working conditions. Many of these feminists were guided by principles of their religious faith, by their Judeo-Christian values. They were pro-family, and they were against divorce. So, so these early feminists, some of them had some really good intentions. But as always seems to happen, this movement was very quickly hijacked. And as we, as we study this, we read that there was women that came alongside these early feminists who did not share a devotion to biblical principles. Feminists such as Elizabeth Caddy Stanton saw the Bible in Orthodox Christianity as the real cause of women's oppression. And in an attempt to undermine the biblical foundation of sex roles, she published the Woman's Bible in 1895, which reinterpreted scriptures dealing with women and asserted that the Bible was not the inspired word of God, and, but had been deliberately man manipulated by male translators you're hearing some of the same things today. There are women that are saying these kinds of things today that while it's a male-dominated book, written by male translators, this is, is not really the word of God. Stanton claimed that in America, we have a state without a king, a church without a pope, and now we are to prove it possible to have a family without a divinely ordained head. She urged women to rebel against the idea of heaven-ordained subjection, these views marginalized the radicals from the women's movement, but their ideas did not die. And so we read that in the 1960s, during the civil rights era, um, a second wave of the women's movement and a return of radical ideas started to target marriage in the traditional family. Please follow along. This is, this is, this is fascinating. 
and, th and, and this is historical. Um, some of you have heard of women such as Betty Friedan. Um, women during this time were told that domestic roles in the house were inferior and restrictive. Betty Friedan, who was a former revolutionary turned housewife, beckoned women to a brave new world outside the home. She described her plight as a trapped housewife. Um, she wrote that she felt like a freak, passive and apart, due to a feminine mystique which defined woman only as a husband's wife or children's mother. Frieden asserted that a woman's real fulfillment and identity were in a career outside the home. Her message found a receptive audience in a, ge in a generation enamored with freedom in discarding traditional values. She acknowledged that her own education did not prepare her for a domestic role she was trying to play. And she sensed no great purpose as a housewife or mother. She quoted Theodore Parker in her book. She says, um, and, and, and this is what he says, he's a, a liberal Boston theologian from the 1850s who said to make one half of the human race or woman consume its energies in the functions of housekeeper, wife and mother is a monstrous waste. Frieden's book speaks of marriage as a state of slavery, asserting that women can only become complete human beings by rejecting marriage and motherhood in an act of rebellion Frieden divorced her husband, she moved out of suburbia, and helped spark a sexual revolution. Today, millions have followed her example. Something that I want you to know about the, the front runners, the, the mothers of the, of the modern feminist movement, as they lured women out of the home and nearly destroyed the traditional family in a single generation, these women... If you look at their lives, they were very unhappily married or divorced. They had horrible marriages or they were divorced. They were never married. Many of them were, were childless or bisexuals or lesbians. They labeled devotion to home and children a virtually worthless pursuit. And women who enjoyed being homemakers as mentally disturbed. If you, if you said you enjoyed being a wife and a mother, there was something wrong with you. You were, you were mentally disturbed. You were less than. You were a simpleton. They viewed men as expendable. That happiness was independence by divorce or abortion, if necessary. Sexual freedom demonstrated equality and heterosexual love, love between a man and a woman was inferior to love between two women. These radical feminist leaders generated a third movement among women known as the resenter feminists. Walking in the footsteps of Stanton, who resented being born a woman, she was unhappy that she'd been born a woman, these women are organized, angry, and determined to change totally the way society thinks and functions. They blame men in a biblical-based patriarchal society created by men for women's woes. They consider knowledge, truth, and reason to be masculine concepts used to control women. They question all history because it was written largely by men. Naomi Goldberg explained their ultimate goal, and, and this, is, this is incredible. The, the ultimate goal of feminism as according to these radical feminists, was to engage in the slow execution of Christ in Jehovah. God the Father of Judeo-Christian scripture, as the architect of the patriarchal society, will have to go, they said. We women are going to bring an end to God, was their thought. Women's study programs have become battlegrounds in a gender war where younger women are converted to view society as a patriarchal system of oppression that must be overthrown. In feminist classes, resentment is harbored and nurtured 
and women are encouraged to get angry as they discuss how they have been victimized by men. Lesbianism is promoted as a wedge for dismantling patriarchal culture. Goddess worship is fostered and erotic pleasure emphasized. Feminist educators want boys educated more like girls to rescue them from their masculinity. As we consider all of those things, I want us to ask this question. What are the fruits of 40 years of feminist activity? As you consider that, I'd like you to ask yourself, how has my ideology been affected by feminism? Because believe it or not, we might say we don't allow those things to affect us. But somehow, over and over again, you know, the, 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 this propaganda, this, uh, this machine that spins over and over again, you know, media knows this, secular feminists know this, that a message that is constantly repeated cause, causes the ears of people to become dull and receptive to it. On the positive side of the last 40 years of feminism, today women have better wages, they have more freedom, they have more opportunities, they have fewer barriers in nearly every part of life. However, something else has happened in the last 40 years. As women have left the home for the workplace, the quality of family life has deteriorated. Latchkey children have appeared. Latchkey children are children who come home after school to an empty house. Trashing traditional moral values and the lack of parental supervision in the home has led to an increased sexual activity among teens, soaring rates of sexually transmitted disease, a 400% rise in births to unwed mothers, increasing numbers of children that are living in single-parent homes, legalizing abortion to facilitate sexual freedom has killed millions of babies and scarred millions of women. All you have to do is look across the landscape of our mothers today and so many of them, not only have they participated in the slaughter of millions of innocent children, so many of them have. So many men have encouraged these mothers to do these kinds of things because of selfish reasons. But, but here's, here's part of the problem. Millions of women are scarred, live the rest of their life with the pain and regret of carelessly disposing of a human life. Yes, there's forgiveness. Yes, God is able to restore. That scar, though, will always remain. And, and across our world today, mothers, for the sake of selfishness, have abandoned the calling that God has upon their life because, you know, the number one reason today why women abort children is because of inconvenience. Inconvenience. You know, the, the left would have us believe that it's because of abuse. Which is about 1% or less than 1% of the time. It's inconvenient. And it's become inconvenient because the feminist movement has told mothers that being in the home is inferior. It's madness. It's you're choosing the wrong idea. You're choosing a simple life. You're, in fact, you're probably mentally disturbed if that's what you are choosing according to our secular world today. Betty Friedan, who was one of the founders of the modern feminist movement, in her book, I want you to notice what she says, and it sounds to me very much like demon possession. And she says this, while I was writing this book, the book took me over. It obsessed me. It wanted to write itself. I've never experienced anything as powerful and as mystical as the forces that seemed to take me over when I was writing The Feminine Mystique. 
And, and so as we look at those things, and, and women, if you are tempted to even allow some of these feminist ideologies to permeate your way of thinking, and you know what, it's all over the place. You know, we, 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 we've allowed some of this mentality to get into our own minds where we start to view the, the Holy Word of God as patriarchal, as written by men for men. Telling men to be dominant instead of understanding that it's the Holy Word of God. When we start to allow our minds to filter through these things, and, and we start to, to believe that men are only here for themselves and, 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 and that women are just victims of men. Yes, uh, there's domestic abuse and it ought to be uh, exposed and it ought to be dealt with. I'm not talking today about that. But I'm talking about this idea that, that there's a victimization of women unfairly all over the place in that it's based on problems with the Bible. That's not true. This is, this is a doctrine of demons. This is something that is coming our way based on the enemy and his plan to destroy the home. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, devoting themselves to deceitful things or deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. And you know what, brothers and sisters, you don't have to look too far to know that, that Christian churches are promoting some of these things. And, and we, we, we must come to this conclusion that we ought to expose this darkness. This is not from the Lord. In fact, it's a deceitful spirit, and it's a teaching of demons. And in 2 Timothy 3, 1, Paul says this again. He says, understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. People will be lovers of self. The, the modern feminist movement has become that. And, and so clearly portrays this, this view of a love of self. And in verse 6 it says, Among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions. I, I don't know of a, a more of a clear verse in Scripture that describes the characteristics of the feminist movement. Remember, in Proverbs 31, it says, Strength and dignity are the clothing of the women. And Paul says, hey, these women are not, are not characterized by strength and dignity. They're weak women. They're, they're women that have a desire to fulfill their own passions. Like he says here, they're burdened with sins. They're led astray by passions. And, and these people are creeping into households, and they're deceiving women. To, to believe this feminist ideology. And, and so women are, are leaving their homes in droves and, and are believing the lie that they're going to receive more fulfillment in a career. They're going to receive more fulfillment uh, serving in some executive office under some kind of boss and slaving away the rest of their life to please another man rather than ministering to their children and husband in their home. You know, women are, are, not, are not understanding this unique calling upon their life anymore. And, and as a result, children are being raised without a mom in the home. And so we ask ourselves, you know, why are our children turning out this way? Well, they don't even have a, a mother who is there tenderly nurturing them and ministering to them on a daily basis. No, it's actually weak women. It's actually weak women who are pursuing something other than the calling of being that mom and wife in the home. God's best is to be a mother. God's best is to nurture your family in your home. It's not out there trying to fulfill your passions. Yes, it's sacrificial. It may even be difficult. And it doesn't fit every situation. I know that as I'm, I'm preaching here on this this morning, that there's broken homes. 
There's homes where, where there's no longer a dad who's providing for the family. And so, unfortunately, in homes like that, women have to provide for the family. That's not God's best, though. That's brokenness. Isaiah chapter 3, 12 says this. And he cries out, he says, My people, infants are their oppressors. And women rule over them. Oh, my people, your guides mislead you, and they have swallowed up the course of your paths. Don't listen to those who, who tell you that they have the best interests of women. It's not true. And I, and I just want to, to say to you, let's bring it back to Titus chapter 2, to you moms, if you don't demonstrate by your lifestyle an example in your sacrifice and your decisions, if you don't take opportunities to teach the younger women to love their husbands and their children and to be keepers of the home, who will? Who will? I, I feel like there's a, a major um, barrier or a, a, a lack of this going on. And, and I want to encourage you, women, start mentoring some younger women. Start teaching them the principles of God based upon His Word. Who will teach them if you don't? It says there that she looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. I know that um, back in, I think it was October, uh, many of you ladies assembled here and you watched a documentary entitled Eve in Exile. Um, just, just prior to that, my wife and I had watched that. And we were reminded again, over and over again, by, by this, this movement, this, this, this uh, ideology that she was teaching, this, this, what she was bringing out, she was sharing how, you know what, this isn't inferior. Homemakers are not inferior. They can, they can so well, so adequately minister to their family better than anybody else can. And so, as you look at that verse, it says, she does well. She looks well to the ways of her household. She's not out and about. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idols. In this documentary, she brings out this thought that, that, that some of the greatest struggles that women deal with is, is this idleness. They're not focusing on on the work of the home, and so they're filling their minds with silly notions, which gives them total opportunity for people to come into the home and lead them astray, whether it's through a podcast or um, a YouTube video or even a social media post. Idleness prompts negative behavior. And you know what? When I, when I look at the biblical mother, and I... I, I often view my wife, and I'm, I, I look at her, and she's a busy person. From morning till night, she has responsibility. And, and during this time of the year, she's, she's busy getting ready her garden for planting because she recognizes she wants to provide food for her family. She's busy out in the yard doing things. She's busy in the house doing laundry. She's, she's busy um, washing dishes and cleaning the house and making meals and looking after the, the needs of the children. And if you were to ask her today, I can guarantee she would tell you that she's fulfilled in doing those things. She's blessed in doing those things. She's happy in doing those things. She has found her calling in life by being in the home, by being a mom. You know, it's idleness that causes us to think about all kinds of other things. The acceptance of our biblical roles contributes to a well-functioning family unit. Proverbs 14.1 says this, The wise woman builds her house on a foundation of godly precepts and her household thrives. But the foolish one who lacks spiritual insight 
tears it down with her own hands by ignoring godly principles. That's the amplified version. It stretches it out. And you know, you have before you a decision you can make, mothers. You know, God has a destiny and a plan for you, and so does the enemy. The decision is yours. And I just want to close with this thought here this morning. Uh, a, a biblical mother is focused on her walk with the Lord rather than competing with worldly aspirations. When you look at verse 30 and 31 there of Proverbs chapter 31, you see this. This, this woman, this godly mother, she says, Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her works praise her in the gates. You know, these, these women, these godly women, these biblical mothers understand that, that beauty is only skin deep and it needs to come from within. That it's character that comes out and that will be lasting. That charm is deceitful, beauty is vain, and, and even the passions and pursuits of life are vain when compared to God's purpose. You know, the biblical mother does a self-examination. She does an inventory and says, what are my ideals? Do I spend my life focused on my, on my physical body? Am I, am I caught up in, in, in makeup? Am I caught up in, in presenting my body? Am I, you know, in, in, in our world, in our ideal feminist world, women are getting surgery all over to, to try to make their body appear what ought to be presentable to our society. And many of them are deeply unhappy and are constantly spinning their wheels. There's no joy there. There's no satisfaction. There's good news, though. I want to wrap up with this. It's not all bad news. There's good news. I want to go back to this, this article I was sharing from earlier. And he says this, in spite of decades of feminine pronouncements that fulfillment should be sought in a career outside the home, many women today are making astounding discoveries. There's a movement going on. It's, and it's exciting. I'm, I'm so excited to see it. Anyways, women today are quitting their jobs. Many of them are. And they're moving to the suburbs, to, to the country, to rural settings, to raise children. And they're startled. They're startled by how much they enjoy being mothers. Testimony after testimony of women are saying, hey, I never thought I would enjoy it so much. Many young women, after training for careers, later discovered that raising a family demands far more brains and creativity than they would need in the corporate world. They've discovered that, that being moms actually really makes you, your, your, your mind work. It, it takes a smart woman to raise a family, a much smarter woman than who sits in the office in the corporate world. Carolyn Graglia wrote movingly about her own marriage. And she's been one of the um, women who've been trying to expose some of these things. And she says, when I stopped practicing law, she, would, she was a lawyer. You know, today, many feminists would look upon a, a, a woman who was a lawyer and say, you've, you've kind of achieved the top. You know, that's, that's the high calling of any man. You've achieved that as well. And so she says this. When I stopped practicing law and became a housewife, an unexpected benefit was that I felt even better loved than before. She says, I begin to feel the glow of contentment and self-satisfaction, which derived in part from the realization that my husband cared for me enough to provide so well for me and our children. She was like, hey, this is a good feeling. My husband goes out and he works diligently. And he provides enough for me and my children. It's a good feeling. 
she found that the joys and delights of motherhood, motherhood were not only incomparably satisfying, but were the best learning experiences of her life. She understood that her role in molding the lives of a future generation was much more significant than preparing legal briefs. She sensed an incredible purpose that woman like Betty Frieden had missed. I want to share this testimony of another woman, um, and I'll stop. Joanna Hyatt is her name, and she says this, Women today stand at a stunning place in history. She says, Never before have there been as many opportunities for us to pursue careers and passions in whatever form we desire. She says this, we can also manipulate our fertility in ways that we could not have imagined. Just the other day, I read an article where they were saying more moms than ever are delaying motherhood by freezing their eggs. And I, I look at that with dismay because God has so clearly built the young women for children. And so, sadly, many women in their late 30s and early 40s are, are making a decision where they're like, now I'm going to start my family. And their body is worn down. Their body's not in the place it was when they were in their early 20s. God knows better than we do. She says in her, in her article here, we can choose to shut it off, our body. We can turn it back on. We can use medical intervention when it doesn't function as we desire. And she says, I cannot speak for every woman but for myself. All those choices sometimes leave me paralyzed and overwhelmed. Wondering if I'm making the right choice in my work, parenting, marriage, and the constant struggle to hold it all in the balance. Because the barely talked about secret that we all come to painfully realize, we cannot have it all, all the time. There comes a choice for every woman who becomes a mother Whatever the circumstances may be that led her to that point, will she sacrifice for the good of her children? Will she surrender some of her immediate dreams, her daily wants, and her comforts so that another human life can have the opportunity to thrive? And she says this, 50 years from now, 50 years from now, most of our names will just be whispers on the wind. And no one will care about our Instagram feeds. Our legacies won't be in the vacations we took or the jobs we held, but in the lies we brushed up against on the daily, in the countless little moments where we serve someone in need. As a country, she says, we're losing the capacity to think beyond ourselves and sacrifice the good for our fellow man, let alone future generations. It's infecting every area of our society from politicians to Wall Street, investors to teenagers are posting or saying anything to be part of the crowd, even if it leads to someone's suicide. She says it's not always glamorous, it's clearly not trendy, but service and sacrifice are the life fabric of a society. Learning that foundational truth begins at home, modeled by moms and dads. If we cannot see that those under our own roof are worth sacrificing for, then it's no wonder we're becoming a me-first culture. And I, I say these things to you because I realize that even the, the idealistic version or this, this ideology of, fe of feminism slowly creeps into our way of thinking. And you know what? I, I want you as moms, as women... As teenagers, as young teens, like young, young ladies who aren't even married yet. You know, you have an opportunity to spend the rest of your life. You can go to college, you can go to university. You can aspire to fulfill your passions on a career. But I want you to ask, is this God's best for me? Or do I have an opportunity as unpopular as it is to demonstrate to the world around me that I 
believe God has called me to motherhood. And you know what, men? We have an opportunity to come alongside our women. And if that's their aspiration, to be a homemaker, don't push them into a career or a job. I want to encourage you as men, do what you can to provide for your home so that your mom, your, your wife, your, this woman in your life can be a mom to your children. Do whatever it takes. Sell your house and, and simplify. If you need to downsize, stop going on vacations if you have to. We, we need to care about the, the nuclear family unit. And, and we need to do our part in what little time we have left to raise up a godly generation and to show women that motherhood is important, that motherhood is godly and biblical. And it's actually the best. It's God's best. You know, Helen and I are often so blessed when we, we, we talk to our, our, our teenage girls and they tell us, Mom and Dad, you know what I want to be? I want to be a mom. I don't discourage that in any way. In fact, if they tell me, you know what, I don't want to go to college, I'm totally okay with that. And I know in our world today, that's an unpopular way of thinking. I'm totally okay with that. And if they are looking at their mom and they're saying, I, wanna, I want what you have. You know, uh, we've been blessed with eight children. And Helen and I are often looking at our children and we're like, how is it possible that God gives us so much love for every single one of them? It's, we, we don't even understand it. And yet we know that our Father in Heaven has poured His love upon us and given us a love for our children that is incredible. And I, I want you to experience that too. And I delight when my, when my girls tell me this, that, you know, I have no greater desire in life than to be a mom. If only we would see this to a greater degree. If only our society would see this. And yet we allow some of, the, some of their thinking to permeate us. There's only one way, and I'd say it's God's way. God wants his best for you. Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for moms today. Lord, you have blessed us with women, even in the church here today. Thank you, Lord. I want to thank you for every female here today, Lord. You have an incredible calling upon every single one of their lives, Lord. Father, may they, may they grasp it, Lord. May they live it. May they fulfill it, Lord. Father, we know that there's an enemy who is constantly whispering lies to these women and, and trying to lead weak women out into the world to fulfill their passions, Lord. According to your word, Father, would you, would you protect our women under the blood of Jesus Christ, Lord? Would you raise up many godly mothers, even from our midst here, who have an aspiration, a desire to fulfill this incredible calling in their life, Lord. To be willing to say, here am I. I may not be much, but I can be a mom. I can be a mom in the kingdom of heaven. And I just pray, Lord, give these women that desire. Would they see their fulfillment in those things? Would they see how much they can impact the world by just raising their little ones up for the Lord? To be there for their teenagers when their teenagers need them, Lord. Father, what an incredible um, calling you have upon women. And I just pray for the fathers and the men here and all the young men even, Lord. Would you help every male here to understand the calling that you have upon women and to not seek to usurp that, to not get in the way of that, to support that and to bless that, Lord. Thank you for what you will do, Lord. And we just pray that you would cause much growth to come. Guide us, Lord. Help us to be fruitful as we live out the ideal set in your word, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.